pizza day. So head on down to the cafeteria to grab yourself a hot slice. Welcome back to the Special Containment Podcast. Today's guest is Exploring Series, also known as Mang. Say hello. Hey there. Also note, Mang is the reason this exists. He's the man that suggested this. <laughs> that's that's true. Yeah, so it's only fitting that you're our first guest on this podcast. Also, I'm here. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, so basically what we're doing is having two to three hosts. We realized having all four of the gang would be a bit of a shit show. So we'll be swapping on and off each episode. So, Ming, are you a full-time YouTuber? Is this a part-time thing? Yes, uh, it is my full-time job. I went full-time in 2017, actually. Although it was not super uh, profitable in 2017. What was your subscriber count around that time? That was like... 75,000 maybe uh i had sort of a unique very cheap living situation that allowed me to to sustain it and that allowed me to sort of put all my focus into it which i think helped me grow that's kind of where i'm at i just live at home thankfully my parents are supportive i can imagine that it's uh it's a lot difficult a lot more difficult if you are like working a full-time job and you have a family that you have to take care of and things like that to really put a lot of effort into YouTube. So it was unique for me that it was a lot easier. Oh yeah, if I had a family or kids or a wife, I'm sure this wouldn't be a possibility, but I'm trying to make it work right now and I've only got like 12,000 subscribers. It's tricky. I mean, you've grown crazy fast. Like in two years, you've got uh, like 300K now? Yeah, I'm a little over 300K now. I've It's been pr- pretty good, pretty good. <laughs> I can't complain. Yeah, that's uh, pretty insane. Is it pretty steady, the growth, or is it on and off? Overall, it is. it was pretty steady for quite a while. Um, you know, I started doing Cthulhu Mythos, and I moved on to Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, Elder Scrolls, stuff like that. Uh, and then I hit SCP, which I didn't even think at first that I could do, um, and I thought it would not be a big hit at all. I was not aware of how big the community had grown, and then suddenly the channel really, really started exploding. Horror is mainstream now. Yeah. Yeah, I'm getting that same thing where I met someone yesterday who knew what SCP was. Random guy, and I was just like, this is weird. Yeah. Meeting someone in the flesh who knows this. And I <laughs> I got recognized in uh, Qdoba like a couple months back. I was wearing my Exploring Sherry shirt, and the, the cashier there was just like, oh, I'm a big fan of that guy's stuff. I was just watching his SCP videos today, and I was like, well, that's me. <laughs> So yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty awesome. You know, I first I don't know. This is probably going to be one of your questions, I'm sure. But I first discovered SCP around 2011. Uh, okay, so about the same time as me. Yeah, and back then it was not <laughs> not that big of a deal. And I took a few years hiatus from it, where I just didn't look at it. So to come back now to see how big it's grown, it's pretty awesome. I mean, yeah, that's like it started in 2008, right? I'm trying to remember. I think it's like 10 years old now. Yeah. Yeah, it's 2007 or two. No, it's 2008, wasn't it? No, it's 2007 was when it very, very first began because it was uh, SCP-173 was written on 4chan around that time. June 22nd, 2007. I mean, how'd you find it? Were you just randomly scrolling on the internet? I, I want to say that it was through 4chan. I was a, a visitor of that site in those days, so I'm sure someone on there mentioned it and linked it the, the main site. And I remember going to the site for the first time and thinking it was like some weird secret government thing that I was tricked into going to. And I was like, this, what is, I, I'm out of here. And, and then I, I remember thinking about it, I was like, why would they send me to this weird government site? So I went back and I was like, oh, okay. This is yeah, interesting. I know that, that, that that immersion is sort of like the main draw of the site. Yeah. Weirdly, it's the main draw of the site and also something that uh, I've seen numerous people complain about because, you, of course, you've got kids that show up and go, oh, my God, SCP is real. Yeah. I mean, that is you probably get that on your channel, right? Yeah. I mean, I 
make great efforts to sort of, in my explanations, mention the like the SCP universe and things like that. I, I try to imply often that it's not real. So I don't think I have as big of a problem as some channels where they make like Forlorn Foundry, where you try to make it look mm -hmm. sometimes pretty authentic. Um, yeah, that's the goal, I guess. I've actually had <laughs> people comment and say, I really wish you wouldn't say that it's not real. That's part of the enjoyment factor. I mean, I still get people on my channel saying that I'm pretending to be a doctor and pretending or like that I'm not really with the foundation and the foundation is real, even though half of my content is focused on how to write for the SCP Foundation as a fiction site. Yeah. So my audience feels pretty split, to be honest. Our goofy, dark comedy shit is obviously not real. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we get, I guess, more old school kind of people that are like, you know, what is this shit? Keep it to the found footage stuff. Yeah. But I mean, you know, Vogan has talked about this before. We, we try not to get too trapped. We try to do both. So that way, if we get ideas, you know, if, if we don't want to deal with the burnout, you can always change it up, spice it up with new ideas. I was honestly at one point getting pretty tired of the found footage shit. Uh, so we were getting we we're getting back into it again, but we just try to balance the two. I definitely get it. That is an interesting thing about Volgan's content is that because it's readings and because the production quality is so high, it definitely itself has a found footage feeling to it. So I bet he has the biggest problem of all. Like this, they seem like they're real files that somebody has just discovered and started reading to their audience. I mean, our painting video is ridiculous. Half the comments are, is this real? It's, it's so frustrating. Like, there's literally credits at the Wait, end. Wait, but is like, that guys. good or bad? Think about it. Because if, if people believe... A third are like, is this real? And the other third are like, fake, in all caps. Ah, uh, okay. So that that is bad. You don't want the people thinking it's fake. But the people that think it's real, I mean, that's a compliment to your capacity to create. Well, Exploring Series, what's your audience like? Is it mainly North America, Europe? I think it's like 55% US, 15% uh, UK. I think something like that. I haven't looked in a while. Oh, damn. We actually get a lot of Vietnamese and Russians. Uh, and it seems like, especially in Vietnam, a lot of people believe it's real because there are some big Vietnamese SCP YouTubers that fake that it's real. Oh, yeah, I've seen those videos. Mm -hmm. They also steal a lot of stuff, if memory serves. Yeah. Like, there's a lot of content that goes up on Vietnamese YouTuber sites that are basically just lifted from other people. Well, I think that's always going to be an inherent problem with the SCP universe. But it's also part of what makes it so interesting is you, you sort of have this somewhat grounded approach to a horror situation and the fact that this this could be real, as opposed to, you know, some SCPs really just kind of throw out the whole concept of reality, and it's just, there's no way anyone would think this is real. Um, and other SCPs paint a much more realistic picture. I mean, I was always into, like, you know, part of the reason that I got into SCPs and what drew me into SCP was I was always into, like, cryptozoology shit. Mm -hmm. And this idea of fantasy and reality blurring and like, you know, SCP hits that shit in the head most of the time. And, you know, a lot of that is I, I'm a Cthulhu mythos nerd, I suppose. So I always relate the SCP universe to Lovecraft. But that was a big appeal of Lovecraft's writing is that there is this whole sort of universe beyond the, the veil of normal human existence. And that's a big part of the horror. And so I think a lot of that carries over to, to most of the horror SCP writing. Well, yeah, an exploring log is almost just like a, a H.P. Lovecraft story, but written in a scientific way because almost all of his best stuff, I, don't, I haven't read all of it, so I don't know if it's all of it or not, but it's written from a first-person perspective. So when you get to watch mm -hmm. somebody going through an SCP in first person, it's a, almost literally the same thing. I think of like rats in the walls. That's one yeah. of my favorite Lovecraft stories, especially how it starts out, you know, pretty mundane, which I think a lot of SCP files do. Uh, it's pretty mundane and then shit escalates quickly. And it's like, how the fuck did I get here? That Those are some of my favorite SCPs where it just starts and it's like, this is a hairbrush. And then you, you keep going, you keep going. It's like, okay, this is uh, an ap apocalyptic scenario now. Um, as you slowly start to peel back that veil of horror. Yeah, I also like the ones where it's pure world building. Like, I watched your Hank King video. Well, this goes into my questions, but the art you get for these videos is crazy. 
and it really brings me to this world. It's almost like the same mystique that Harry Potter or these really big fantasy novels and series have to them, where you're completely immersed in this whole new universe and that has a whole new set of rules. And you go into the whole mythos of these different worlds that the Hain King is from. So where do you get all that artwork? Um, a lot of browsing through DeviantArt and ArtStation. I'm very picky about what artwork I use. Um, I don't like to use any sketches or like black and white stuff. I usually only like digital art. And so artwork is usually the trickiest part of putting together a video because there are a lot of SCPs that are like, this is, you're talking about like metaphysics and, and very vague concepts and not, nothing of this is like filmable or, or drawable. Uh, so putting together videos can be really difficult. I mean, I definitely relate to that, especially when I have to figure out how to make that happen in live action. I mean, that's why there's a ton of shit we don't touch for that reason. Right, I, I can imagine, like, a, I'm sure you get plenty of requests to do, like, 1730. I think we've gotten that a couple times. Yeah. Or, you I'm know, these, remember, these... 1730 is that whatever happened to Site 9, or Site 13? Yeah, that's, like, the big, massive uh, uh, yeah. Infinity War of SCP. I, <laughs> that's a good way to I explain like that. It. I like that one for, I like that one for various reasons, but my favorite part is it's yet another article where uh, Dr. Sumerian dies in the middle. Nice. Oh, I didn't know you were in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a little section in the middle where uh, Dr. Sumerian, uh, who's the head of the ethics committee in that universe, complains about the whole thing that's going on, and they drag him out in the middle of the square and shoot him in front of everybody. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, there are there are SCPs where I'm writing the script. I'm like, I know exactly the artwork I want to use for this. This is going to be great. This, I'm going to be able to use a lot of high-quality stuff. It's going to be perfect. And then there's some where I finish writing the script and I'm like, I have no idea <laughs> what I'm going to put in this video. Uh, a notable example was SCP-3999. Uh, I can't remember the, the name of that uh, one. Oh, that's the one with the guy that waits by people's bedsides after no, the, that's, before, right before they die? That's 4,999. 3999 oh, is with uh, Talaran, where he's sort of... It's with the um, reality bender that like tortures him for a few million years. I've actually never seen this. Huh. This looks interesting. It's it's sort of a format screw and it's just a lot of like insanity stuff going on. It, it's titled I am at the center of everything that happens to me. Oh yeah, this is the meta for one that made people be like worried about the author. Right, and there's all sorts of like strike out or strike throughs and redactions and just it's a lot of insanity and so the script wasn't that difficult to put together but i'm like i don't what am i going to put together for artwork nothing not, nothing of this is like real so i just filled the entire video with like pictures of puppies and kittens like, there you go. <laughs> just, just yeah that, that's great at least that'll make people feel better because i remember hearing many people talk about how that i've not read it myself because the people don't sell it very well to me they're like oh this is gonna make you feel terrible i'm like then why would i read it yeah it it, it had won the poll on my patreon for like my next scp to cover and i was like i i don't know it's really an scp that needs to be read rather than summarized but I gave it my best shot. I'm personally not a tremendous fan of it. I think that the idea, the concept is very interesting, but it gets a little too personal. Uh, what? How, how do you feel like the pacing is on it anyway? Because I've seen long articles like this, and this one just seems like I'm scrolling through it now, and I'm kind of skimming it, and it feels like there's a lot of non-relevant bits. Yeah, I mean, there's a big section here where it's just like the word only repeated like a hundred times. Oh, yeah, that's that's some red reality shit. There's this whole list of like where he basically tries to describe 3999 as different things such as uh, Gary Gygax's kidney or a pillow. And it's just, I think my summary probably might help people that read through it and don't get it completely. But my summary does not replace reading it whereas sometimes i think my summary does replace reading it if it's short enough i can imagine 
Yeah. That reminds me of a thing I heard a while back about how the future of reading is, you know, instead of reading Hamlet, you read two different people's opinions on what Hamlet means. And then people take that as, I read Hamlet. <laughs> I read a Hamlet-shaped hole. Yeah. Basically, it's like everything needs to be bite-sized and condensed. Cliff note. Yeah, like people only want the cliff notes. I mean, I guess that's the convenience of your channel, but I don't think you, I think you dive deeper than a lot. Like that's why like yours, sometimes it can be a bit cliff notes, but then, you know, you take it from there. Like in the beginning, it's what this is about. And then you, you explore, digging deep. <laughs> there are some SCPs where I feel like I'm literally just providing a, a basic summary because there isn't much to go off of it. But there are some times where I'm able to discuss like other SCPs mentioned within a, an article, whereas just reading the article itself won't tell you that. Or I think the the biggest uh, <laughs> uh, I'm blanking on a word, but I think the best things I do usually are the sort of compilation ones, such as the Hanged King or like the groups of interest where I can pull together all sorts of different SCPs to paint a picture. Yeah, it's like a whole world. Yeah. I kind of feel an affinity for your particular type of content because it's somewhat similar to some of the stuff I do. I just love the explore. I love the idea of exploring uh, themes and, and stories in a way that uh, tries to dig a little deeper than just what's on the page. Yeah, and I've, I've got nothing against, like, readings. Uh, clearly, there's a large audience for readings. Um, and I think it would be probably easier for me every week to just do a reading, but I, I, the way that my channel has been constructed, I've always just done these sort of dives into content. And that's why I said at first, I didn't know if I could do that for SCP because I had taken that hiatus. I didn't know that there was so much to it now. Like back in the day, I had read through the first, I had read through series one. I had read the first thousand. And there's only like a handful of SCPs in the first thousand back then that were like really long and interesting. Whereas now we've got this big plethora of awesome stuff. Yeah, and it's kind of weird. Like it used to be more interconnected, but somehow today it's also more interconnected, even if it's more disconnected. Like there are these independent little islands of content that are these, mm -hmm. you know, not even total canons, but just like islands of content that relate to each other. And they're as big as they used as the whole totality of content used to be, but there's like 20 of them now. Well, there's Talking about all those different groups, like the uh, wizard group and all that stuff. I think it's called like the hand or something. Serpent, serpent hand. hand? Oh yeah, the, yeah, the serpent hand. Which always bothers me because serpents don't have hands. Well, there was a time where like cross-linking was really discouraged, right? Mm, yeah, after the fishmonger thing. The idea of like cross-linking kind of died because they were like, well, if somebody pulls their shit from the site. We don't want to have to worry about fixing the cannons or anything. But then right. like, I think it was right around 2014, 2015, people started saying that's really dumb. Mm -hmm. The site's way too big now for us to be like, nothing is related to nothing. <laughs> it's just and I'm, and, and I'm glad it changed from that because I think that allows for much more interesting content. If everything was sort of disconnected, my Hanged King video would just be like SCP-701, and that would be it. Mm -hmm. But since people are starting to build collective worlds and collective canons, it makes for a lot more interesting writing. And especially with, like, Red Reality. I've been touching up on that one again. Yeah, that's my favorite SCP. It's actually uh, my favorite, too. Sorry, Red Reality is... It's where Dr. Scranton gets stuck in between, like, different oh, dimensions. Oh, it's another one of those. See, it's weird how many really popular things I haven't read, but go ahead. I think, I'm pretty sure he discovers Hume Fields. And then in, like, future SCPs, they use Hume Fields as a way of describing and explaining different SCPs. I really like when they build on that kind of type of shit. Yeah, and then they, and they name the Scranton Reality Anchor after him as well. Yeah, I don't... That stuff's cool. I don't know if 3001 is the first mention of Hume levels. Oh, for Hume? Yeah. I don't know if it's the first one. I couldn't say, but... What, 3000? No. Because no, I, I was using... Yeah, I was I was using uh, Scranton Reality Anchors in uh, 2343, so that was back in series. Oh, three. so it's backwards. I have it backwards. 
basically made a story off of Scranton Reality Anchors or whatever. Yeah, that's, been, yeah. It's funny because in series three and four, there's or and probably five at this point, there's been a lot of people complaining of the overuse of Humes and that people don't like it and that the Scranton Reality Anchors are too easy and they solve problems too quickly. Uh, but they really only exist in like maybe a dozen articles, so it's kind of an, uh, it's a weird thing for people to complain about. But mm-hmm. you always get nitpickers. We kind of touched upon this earlier with like how you find art and the research that goes into this. But like, what's your video process? How long does it take for you to make a complete episode? It absolutely depends uh, on the length of the video and the size and scope of the topic I'm covering. If I'm doing a video on a single SCP and it's pretty basic, there's not a lot of cross-linking or anything like that, those videos take like a dozen hours. If it's a massive video such as like The Hank King or uh, a group of interest where I have to research everything, those can take much longer. Um, but usually I start the process just with as much reading as I feel comfortable with. And that has been true for pretty much every video I've ever done. I, I try to read everything over so I can get an entire picture in my mind of what I'm talking about. Uh, and then you, I... Go ahead. How do you tend to reconcile when there are, like, multiple versions of the same thing? Ooh, what do you mean, multiple versions? Well, I mean, you know, there is no canon. So, like, when you're doing a lore deep dive, uh, and say on the Church of the Broken God, there's maybe mm -hmm. two or three primary interpretations of it. How do you reconcile that? Uh, I'll generally always mention that there's no canon and that, that this is just one possible interpretation. But usually I will defer to whatever is the highest rated stuff, which might not be the best way, but is generally the way that I can assure that it's going to be the most well received. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, that is true. Because if I, if I just go with the most popular stuff, people are much less likely to say, well, why didn't you cover this obscure article? Whereas if I go with the obscure article, people are like, what are you doing? How could you not talk about this? Ultimately, there's always going to be things cut out of almost every video I do. And that's sometimes some of the trickiest stuff is deciding how much do I include on a topic? What do I include? What do I cut out? Well, uh, well I feel like this is a very common issue with YouTubers, but... Obviously, you're reading stuff that you have personal interest in. Yes. Does the work and the free time ever blur a little too much? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like, like that, that dozen hours number is... <laughs> that's pretty much like the writing and the editing. The reading stuff, I never really calculate. Because uh, obviously... Does it ever feel like work, though? That, that does not, usually. Well, that's nice. Um, there are topics that I cover that I'm not that interested in. I just do it for the sake of... YouTube, uh, but it, it is a big plus that I'm very interested in SCP. I mean, yeah, you've been doing it for what, like you said, three years now? The Exploring series? Sorry, like two years, right? Uh, well, I went full time two years ago. I started three years ago. I feel like by then, if your heart's not in it, you know, like you're not going to get stuff consistently done uh, and well done. Yeah, I mean, well, I started with the Cthulhu Mythos because I was just a big fan of that. I don't know if I have time to really tell my whole story. Nah, go for it. Okay. Well, I've been on YouTube for about eight years now. Uh, I mainly do Let's Plays on my other channel, which I've uploaded uh, a video every day for the last eight years for like 20 viewers. Um, and so one day, a few years ago, I stumbled across a video that was titled The Cthulhu Mythos Explained. And it was a 15 minute long video. And I was thinking, there's no way you could explain all of the Cthulhu mythos in 15 minutes. That's, that's impossible. Uh, I should do a, a series. I should like a series where I explore the Cthulhu mythos. Uh, and so that led to the, the first video on Cthulhu. And because I was a big Cthulhu mythos fan, I had been reading a lot of Lovecraft. I played the Call of Cthulhu RPG. And so I just wanted to make a short series for my 20 fans to enjoy so I could so I could tell them some stuff. And up to that point, I had never scripted anything. I'd always just done off the cuff because I was so used to doing Let's Plays. But I made a conscious decision. I was like, if I if I do this Cthulhu video off the cuff, it's going to be 
55 minutes long and it's going to be all rambling. So I decided to script it, which is like the most important decision I've ever made. Um, and so then the Cthulhu Mythos series started and a few videos in, I noticed that the Cthulhu video was starting to get like hundreds of views and that had never happened to me before. I'm like, wow, there must be some sort of audience for this. And so I kept, yeah, so I kept going. Uh, and then I quickly realized a, a few months in that there's not that many topics in the Cthulhu Mythos that I could make a condensed video about. And so one person commented very randomly that I should explore Lord of the Rings. I was like, that's a pretty good idea. There's a big audience for that. So I started, I moved on to Lord of the Rings, uh, Middle Earth. And at the time when I started that, to my great shame, I never actually read Lord of the Rings. Damn. Yeah. So oh, I had to do a, <laughs> I had to do a lot of research uh, very quickly. I'm judging about, you very hard over here. I know. I, I've read it now. Don't worry. Uh, but I had never read Lord of the Rings and I had never read Silmarillion. Well, the latter is more understandable. Yeah, yeah. right. And well, uh, to, to be fair, I haven't read it either. <laughs> I mean, I, I started uh, Lord of the Rings, the Fellowship of the Ring, and I couldn't finish it. It was too boring to me. But yeah. Continue. Um, but so I was so used to the Cthulhu mythos where pronunciation does not matter at all because it's all alien languages and stuff. So my first Lord of the Rings video on Sauron was a disaster because I mispronounced everything and I got brutally scolded for it. Uh, but I would say Lord of the Rings is where it really started to hit home that I could do it full time because my Sauron video there, there was like a random Lord of the Rings video that made it to the trending page, even though it was like a five year old video. And for whatever reason, my Sauron video was the next in queue on that trending video. So I was like sub trending. And so that brought a lot of views to my channel. Uh, so I did Lord of the Rings and then I'm like, OK, what else do I really enjoy talking about? And so I moved on to Star Wars. I thought Star Wars is huge. This is going to be great. Uh, but it wasn't great because I was a very small fish in a gigantic pond. Uh, so I only made like 15 videos for Star Wars and I realized this is I'm not getting any views. This is terrible. I need to switch it up. So from then on, I switched to whenever I finish a series, I'm just going to do a poll on my channel to decide the next thing I talk about. This was very nerve wracking at first because I knew I was going to get hit with stuff that I have no interest in and I know nothing about. But the the next series that I did was the Elder Scrolls, which I was familiar with. Um, definitely a lot there. Yeah, Weird there was there was a, there was a lot to cover. And I learned a great deal about the Elder Scrolls and that ended up being pretty popular. And then I did another poll and I moved on to Norse mythology, which I knew the only things I knew about Norse mythology were from Thor. So <laughs> hmm. I would, that was completely new to me. And I had to just, I was, you know, reading these old Norse books and just, it was very nerve wracking, but that ended up being a pretty decent series. Yeah. Uh, what I know about Norse mythology, I've always, it's probably my favorite of, amongst all the mythologies I have much knowledge of just cause it, the stories are, I guess more, they're closer to modern than some of the Greek stuff. Some of the Greek stuff, I mean, it's true of Norse mythology too, but some of the Greek stuff and Roman stuff you read, you're just like, what the fuck? Yeah. But with I mean, Norse, you're at least, it seems like real people for once. It's cause maybe it's cause it's only in the last thousand instead of last two or three thousands. There are absolutely Norse stories that are ridiculous. Like, um, Loki having to make a girl laugh. So he has a tug of, uh, the tug of war is that what I'm thinking of? Oh, with the rope. yeah, something yeah, roughly around. He, he, has, yeah. he has a contest with a goat where he ties the rope around his own testicles. Yeah, there's there's stuff like that. But it was yeah, overall no. very interesting. I learned a lot about Norse mythology. I had a great time, and then I did another poll. And because all of my recent fans at the time were mythology fans, the next series that won was Celtic mythology. Which I knew even less about. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I don't know much about the Celtic mythology personally. Though. Yeah, uh, there's some very interesting stuff in there, and I learned a lot. 
Um, but then I realized that series did not do as well. And I was like, okay, if I just do another poll as normal, I'm just going to get another mythology. I'm going to get like Greek mythology or something like that. And I want to take a break. I want to go back to fictional stuff. So for that next poll, I was like, okay, no mythologies, anything else goes. And the one that ended up winning was, to my surprise, SCP. And when which, was that exactly? That was in, that was last August, I think. Oh, wow. So you're almost up to a year of SCP content then. Yeah. The same like the kind of thing you're just going to keep doing? Yeah, it's it's been doing too well for my channel for me to stop. And that disappoints a lot of my sort of uh, previous subscribers. Like, and that's always been a problem with my channel because I, you know, I had these people come in for Cthulhu Mythos and they're like, yeah, this is a great Cthulhu oh, Mythos yeah. channel. And then it's like, why is he doing Lord of the Rings? Yeah. What is this? I'm not interested. Like, one of those big pieces of advice they give you is not to change too, gr too drastically. Right. <laughs> and that's just always been how I've done it now. Um, and then they came in for Lord of the Rings and they're like, why is he talking about Star Wars now? This is completely different. So that's... There, yeah, but I, I figure a... if you were... To be fair, Cthulhu, Mythos, and SCP probably has so much cross-section that you'd be fine, but the stuff in the middle... Yeah, the people that have been around since Cthulhu, Mythos are probably not too upset, but the people that came in for Celtic mythology are not too crazy about, like, me covering Warhammer 40k. Right, yeah. So, yeah, SCP has been doing really well, but I realized that I needed something to sort of break it up. And I also didn't want to completely alienate all of my previous fans. So I had another poll start in January to decide sort of a side series. And that ended up being Warhammer 40k, which is another thing that I knew absolutely nothing about. But now I know a good amount about it, and it's been pretty fun. Kind of an interesting uh, lore that I've, I've never actually read any of the books or looked into any of the lore like hardcore, but around the edges, read, you know, Wikipedia pages and stuff like that. It seems quite interesting, really. It's science fiction for like the biggest science fiction nerd, pretty much. Yeah, it, it, a little it's, bit of fantasy it's, it's like the most course. metal of, of science fiction. Uh, it's been pretty good. The only problem that I have with Warhammer 40k, to be honest, and not just like not to offend anyone, but it's fandom is not the most welcoming, it seems. Wait, wait, wait. Is the fandom worse than the SCP fandom? Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't say worse. Just different. Not that the SCP... To be fair, our audience is in the SCP fandom. But right, they're, yeah. They're, but some of the... some of the, Especially from the website itself, a lot of the writers and the uh, like higher-ups and just tend to be a little bit snobby towards youtube content so i'm curious what your experience is with people who are into the warhammer thing uh, i mean every fandom has its issues no doubt the problem that 40k has is that you have these people that take it so seriously which is yeah. true of, of every fandom but the thing with warhammer 40k for those that aren't aware is that pretty much the main faction in warhammer 40k is humanity and the whole shtick of humanity in 40k is that they are completely xenophobic and they're very like they're very religiously xenophobic and so yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of these very serious fans that sort of adopt that uh oh right the persona people, yeah. it's just like with the scp people who pretend like doctors or agents or something i gotcha right it's it's like that but they they like take the concept of hate as like their core philosophy uh, and they tend to just role play all the time this persona uh, to anyone that is nearby and so it feels very off-putting yeah especially uh, considering how gr literally grimdark it is yeah so you, you'll you know you'll you'll enter into this discussion with of warhammer 40k and the person will just go off about you know slaughtering uh heretics and alien you know and just violence and hate and it's just yeah it's, it's a little off-putting that that's been my yeah. problem with 40k but overall the actual lore has been pretty awesome so here's a question what do you think of uh the sc well since we're talking about fandoms and problems and etc and mm -hmm. i'm sure you haven't had too many issues with it what do you think of the scp fandom and what's your interactions been with say authors and stuff like that on the site 
I have not had that many interactions with authors. Uh, only a couple that have been... Actually, a few. They've all been very happy that I'm covering their stuff, which has been very nice. Um, like, the one that I'm thinking of is uh, Dr. Bright. Yeah, yeah, I, don't, yeah. I don't know what name he's going by right now, but the actual author behind Dr. Using... Bright. Yeah, I think he, I think he's actually gone back to using his actual Dr. Bright name or maybe the administrator okay. Dr. Bright or something like that. Yeah. So, you know, people wanted me to make a video about Dr. Bright, which is uh, probably my biggest problem with the fandom. But I'm, I'm not a very uh, jokey person or I have a very specific sense of humor that doesn't meld with the SCP sense of humor most of the time. And so Dr. Bright, I was familiar with sort of all the memes and I was like okay you want to make I if I have to make a video about Dr. Bright it's going to be a completely serious video <laughs> that has nothing to do with memes <laughs> and just looks at like the lore behind this character I feel like that misses I feel like that would miss some of the nuance of the uh, of the character because a lot of it is very tongue-in-cheek yeah uh, but it's just that's that's you know I figured there's enough videos about like the stuff that he's not allowed to do and, and all these memes and things like that. I don't know how many videos there are about like his the Bright family and stuff like that. Yeah, I was talking to someone recently who was bringing up the Bright family and I'm like, I don't know anything about the Bright family personally, but. Right. So that's what I set out to make a video on. And, and there's actually quite a bit uh, related to the family that's very serious and non humorous. But I was putting together this video and I was like, I've never talked to the actual writer, Dr. Bright. I, I'm not sure how he feels about the character and, and the serious stuff that's been written and the joke stuff that's been written and blah, blah, blah. So I was a little worried with if he actually watched my video, how he would feel about this very serious take on the family and the character and stuff. But he ended up leaving a comment on the video um, and he loved it. So that was really awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he's a pretty. Uh, it, a lot of people don't like. I, I've talked to him before uh, because I was part of administration for, or not administration. I was a moderator on the site for a while, and uh, he's a very chill guy, really. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I wouldn't be. I wouldn't. I wasn't. I'm not surprised to find that he, he liked your take on it. He probably enjoys uh, pretty much any time someone brings it up. He's like, oh, that's cool. So, uh, but going back to the other part of the question was the, the fandom in general. Ah, uh, yes. Um, like, I've covered a bunch of different, like, fictional universes and topics and things like that. So I've encountered a bunch of different fandoms in my comment section. Um, and like I said, they all have their problem. No fandom is amazing. But I would say the biggest issue with the SCP community, which is really, it's, it's not their fault. But I think it tends to skew younger. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I feel like the average age of my viewers went down to like 13 once I started covering SCP. And that's fine. Like I said, it's not their fault. And I'm glad that there's plenty of people interested in SCP in general. But the problem when you have such a young community is that memes tend to prevail, I think. Yeah. And so how often someone just isn't funny or isn't uh, isn't particularly clever and play it off as being like, I was just making a meme. Yeah. And so that, or you know, it was just edgy. We have these few SCPs that are far, far more popular than anything else. And I think that's partly due to just the age of the community that are that are interested in just sort of regurgitating the same content. Sure. But the thing is, is that everyone enters, not everyone, but I think a lot of the SCP fans come in on the same things. So it's like a shared, it's like a common ancestral experience almost because everyone sees the very first few articles that someone says, hey, you got to look at this thing. And now, so everyone's got it in their head that 173 is this or 173 is that. Right. But the thing is, though, I think with a more mature audience, they would move past that and they would look towards the entire scope of the SCP universe. Whereas with a younger audience, they tend to just stick around and re keep making memes about 173 and things like that. Yeah, it's just, I, I don't know if I've ever, ever seen such a meme-tastic <laughs> community as SCP. That, that, that seems like Lord of the Rings 
it does not have that same sort of feel, or at least it right, did not in yeah. my in my comment section. I actually have a question related to fans. Do you have any nightmares with any certain fan bases? Because I remember there was some sort of controversy with the Cthulhu fan base. Nightmares about fan bases? Yeah. You mean just like a particularly bad specific incident? Experience or yeah. Um, not really. I mean, overall, I've been very happy with my personal community on my channel. It's tended to be much more mature. Younger people generally don't look at like deep dives into lore and things like that. So I've been overall yeah, pretty happy. Too. I get a little bit of that too with my side or the mind because it's like a, I do meta like stuff about the SCP Foundation rather than like content of it. Although I do also do lore deep dives myself, but um, also the writing advice stuff. But I've seen the interactions from others, other like uh, the Forlorn Foundry guys or Volgan or Illustrated. And I've seen the, you're absolutely correct when you say that they tend to skew younger and it's very evident. I, I can't imagine what Lord Bung's community, uh, like comment section is like. Oh, it is uh, quite the story. I've definitely been well aware of it because I feel like my community is going to be very similar to Bung's in a lot of regards. Like, I've been on his live streams. I'm not going to shit on fans. You know, you can't do this shit without them. Right. Uh, but when you reach a certain size, it gets chaotic as fuck. Like, the live stream... Is everyone trying? Oh, no, no, no. Sorry, sorry. It was a Patreon call that Jake was in where just him and the patrons, so it wasn't even all the fans, were just going to watch a movie. So instead of watching or talking about the movie, mm -hmm. it was just a ton of fans trying to make memes and jokes to get Bung's attention. Right. So, and that, that's sort of what I'm saying is with that young community, memes prevail. I kind of enjoy it. I think that's... And that, and that, that might just be my, perspe my perspective I because I just have a strong dislike for memes i think maybe the at <laughs> i think maybe the advent of the internet has probably changed our viewpoint on how young people approach like content and everything because mm -hmm. when you were when we were all, all of us were 15 or younger we probably got super and we're talking super excited about something you know like we would just see it and we'd be like this is the best thing i've ever seen in my entire life because our lives were not really all that long yet and um so you, what you want to do is you want to share that experience with other people, but you're not fully formed yet enough to have a like maybe a, a, a full on discussion about it. So you just go, hey, check out this meme. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, memes and gosh, the people that make memes. No, no I don't want to say anything offensive. Uh, no, 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 no. It's too late now. You've already you've already opened the door. Let's talk about let's talk about why you hate memers. Come on, go ahead. It just feels a lot like um, Cards Against Humanity. I see what you're getting at. Like it, it's content for people that can't really make proper content. Yeah, I agree. Like making memes is really easy. I, I'm not entirely sure I agree with that. I think that, I mean well, I think okay, it can yeah, be difficult. I don't want to make like a blanket memes. statement here. There yeah, are yeah. Okay. there are people that make memes that can certainly make quality content and I'm sure somewhere out there there are quality memes that would appeal to even me but in general you you have all these like young teenagers that take some random image and they slap some common phrase on it and boom post it on the subreddit and get a few thousand upvotes I feel that there's some genuine I feel there's some genuine added value to some to again some of it and you're right some of it's somewhat mindless and some of it's just sharing it's like it's like when an old person quotes someone at you. It's not original content they've created. It's literally the same thing. I'd say the main benefit is a sense of camaraderie with, you know, in-jokes. You know, I feel like it's a bit of a bonding situation, especially when you see it out in the blue. Well, well not when I see an R slash SCP a million times, but when I see a mediocre SCP meme out in the blue, it's like, oh, cool. The gang's here kind of thing. I also, you know, thinking back to Sumerian, when I was a teenager, I was super into meme culture, like Filthy Frank, all that stuff. That was definitely the way I bonded with my friends. That's, you know, that's what I keep in mind when I see this swarm of crap. You know, I try to keep my eye out for these few quality memes that will then eventually be destroyed when everyone abuses the fuck out of that format till it's dead. Right. And I don't want to say that, like, memes really 
degrade the SCP universe and the SCP community. Clearly, most of the SCP community is, is interested in that kind of stuff. Um, I just think it tends to sort of dominate a discussion. That is perfectly fair to say, yes. I think there's, I, even even though I'll argue that there's a, a lot of added value to memes, because I, I just particularly think, I think anything that gets people excited about content is good. You are correct in saying that it does tend to supplant the creation of more involved content. I always think it should be something additional to the content, not the primary focus of it. Well, I know for the subreddit at least, r slash scp they have a very strange conundrum where they're on the same page as us where you know they don't want it to be a meme page but they because there is a meme subreddit yeah yeah there's this scp subreddit but they realized if they had a hundred percent no go on memes they're understandably concerned that most of the active users would completely desert i bet they probably would i mean eventually it would die off yeah they're trying to find that balance and it's tricky it's the moderator's call well, what they're doing now is like me Monday, but it definitely still bleeds mm -hmm. through. I also think communities mature and grow over time. You know, as the fan base grows and ages, right now we only have so many young kids because of Markiplier and PewDiePie playing Containment Breach. But I think as they age, you know, the uh, community evolves. Yeah, right. And I'm not trying to offend anyone. And I said that it is good that so many people, even young people, are interested in SCP. I'm just relating my perspective in like my comments section. When I covered mm -hmm. Lord of the Rings, there were a lot of like really insightful, in-depth discussions in my comment section about the Silmarillion and things like that. And when I did Norse mythology, there was a lot of discussions about, you know, different topics within that. But now with SCP, most of my comments are like about Peanut and... <laughs> Fortnite memes and, and things like that and so it's just that's my perspective and I'll be honest this may bother some people but I've actually pretty much stopped reading my comments you stopped reading comments I mean uh, yeah. I definitely have certain videos that I stopped for a long time I read I... every single comment no matter what I, I read it um, then I put a channel wide block on any comment that included the word pronunciation because it really pissed me <laughs> off. Because wow. those comments just wow. are not helpful. Um, then, it's Keter. <laughs> yeah, this this was like when I was doing uh, like Norse mythology and stuff. Um, oh, yeah. Unless you were talking about you had that problem with the Lord of the Rings stuff too, right? Right, and at the first with the Lord of the Rings, it was actually really good and helpful. And I was like, oh, I'm doing something terribly wrong. But eventually, once I got everything sorted out and I actually did research on how to pronounce stuff, and I still got all these comments from people that were just wrong. It just pissed me off. Oh, I get it. There's nothing There's nothing more annoying in this world than someone who is incorrect and doesn't realize it. And is so assured of their righteousness. Yeah, I, that's one of my biggest pet peeves. Recently, I did a video on Anderson Robotics. And I, used, I, I said, uh, Oregon. And I got a bunch of comments that mm. said, it's not Oregon. It's Oregon. I don't I don't think so. Yeah, it's it's oregano, right? <laughs> um so now I occasionally go to my comment section and new comments and just like what are people saying? Did I get anything horribly wrong? Like the first 24 hours of a video release, I read the comments. But after that it's it's always just nonsense. I'd say for our more famous videos we've stopped, like you know, Cup of Joe, the painting, because you just get the same comments over over again it, it becomes demoralizing honestly yeah i mean youtube comment sections have been the butt of jokes for years so it, it's not anything new it's just it's not even that they're negative though it's just it's the same comment right over and over yeah exactly it's just for my mental well-being it has not been beneficial i haven't got me. there yet i don't have enough comments to really be overloaded i think like my oh, last yeah, video, I, I think it's a size. My thing. video before last got is at maybe 400 comments, and I've been able to keep up with it over the last few days. But yeah, I mean, for, like I said, for a long time I read every single comment because it was just so cool. Like, oh, people are commenting on my video; it's amazing. Um, but now I'm I'm jaded. I'm jaded. I think you're also at that size where there's just too many people. You know, the more outreach, the more people you reach, 
the more crap you get. Yeah, I think at a certain point, you just, you can't. Actually, I do have one question, and this does relate back to the bad fan experience question. Have you ever been threatened with, like, doxing or something worse? Uh, there was a threat on my life. I don't know how credible it was, but it was repeated. Uh, it was when I, st not related to SCPs. No one in the SCP community has threatened me with anything. Uh, but this was when I first started doing Star Wars. Uh, someone very menacingly threatened me multiple times that if I didn't stop doing Star Wars and I, I, I didn't go back to Lord of the Rings, he would come to my house and slit my throat. The fuck? Yeah. So, like I said, every fandom has its issues. Um, but I, 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 <laughs> that sounds more serious. Is that was that a Lord of the Rings fan? Like they wanted you to do yeah. Lord of the Rings content, and they were just mad right. you weren't doing it anymore. Exactly. But I put on a brave face, and I, I kept doing Star Wars for a little while. I had someone and, threaten to dox me like a couple weeks ago. They were like, "Talk to me, or I'll dox you." And I'm like, "That's not really much of a threat." And they're like, "What do you mean? I can." They literally use the phrase, I can hack. That is their actual words. Wow. But I mean, it, I, was, I was like, I wasn't doubting your ability to find me. I'm doubting your ability to make me care that you found me. It, is it a legitimate concern for you guys? It is. Nah, it, I don't care personally, it, but. Oh, it's man, not, yeah. It, it's, <laughs> we're talking about me. I'm the guest, remember? God damn it. It's on the fringes of my concern. Uh, I definitely made an effort to like go through like my Facebook past history and sort of like cleanse it uh, of anything that would possibly lead to negative repercussions, things like that. Um, I, it's a benefit that I don't really appear on camera, that I don't go outside the house ever, uh, <laughs> that I'm very isolated. So I, I don't think I'm at risk of ever being stalked or doxxed or anything like that or swatted you're always at risk do you live in a highly populated area because that's my main concern i'm in a pretty densely populated area so it's it's not like you know, no one's gonna fly down to alabama i think to bother a sumerian <laughs> thank you oh wait 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 i should cut that right no then. i don't care I, I mentioned that i live in a suburb um oh, okay yeah I, it, like i said it's, a, it's at the very fringes of my concern I mean, I, I, I got recognized at Qdoba. It was like, that guy knows that I live in the area. Maybe he could find me. But no, no the I, thing I'm, is, is that not really you'll never be able to you'll never be able to wipe everything. I, I've talked to I had a security guy like talk to me before about this problem. And he was like, giving me advice on how to avoid this, that and the other thing. And un, unsolicited advice, actually. But my point to him was always you can never hide the stuff that you put up already. If this was my first time, first day on the internet, I would mm -hmm. totally take all the precautions I possibly could to preserve my anonymity. But my anonymity is already lost, and there's no way I can ever get it back. If somebody is determined enough, no matter how much I hide things, they can find me. So worrying about it doesn't help me at all. Yeah, I mean, like, like I said, it's it's not that big of a worry for me. I'm not like investing in security systems for my home or anything like that. Um, but yeah, it, you just buy the sign and put it out front and pretend like you've got one. Yeah, it, it's a reality that this kind of stuff happens. So, I mean, thankfully, me and Sim aren't even close to the size where we have to worry about it. My mentality is just, you know, in case I get that big, I want to be ready. I don't have to worry too much about it, you know. That is a funny thing to say, is but like, we hope to one day be big enough to worry about these problems. We're just not there yet. My bigger concern would be like sort of a James Gunn situation, I guess, where someone digs up something from when I was like 14 on the internet. And it's like, look how terrible the exploring series is. And then I lose. Honest to God, I don't, I, I, I've lucked out. I mean, I was on the internet when I, in 2000 to 2004, when I was still in high school from literally those years. And I don't, mm, it's a legitimate concern. I don't think I put anything up that I, I would be, I would regret people finding. Well, Good for you, I, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> we do. Is that is that an, is that a common problem? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I definitely think it could be. I'm personally hoping a lot of that hyper collect culture can calm down. You know, I think a lot of people are starting to get tired of it. It's like the new Red Scare. It's getting ridiculous. 
No, yeah. no, some of it's some of it's justified, some of it's not. I'll I'll, I'll give you that. No. Exactly. The issue is when it's not justified. That's where it gets pretty scary. When people lose their careers over really mundane shit. I think it's a matter of time, like and and maturity. Because you look, if you look at some, some, something somebody did at fifteen, and the person they are now at say twenty five or thirty five, is a, you're a completely different person. Like, and the further you get away from like the person you are at fifteen and the person you are at twenty, is so there's a, such a wide gulf between those two people. That almost it almost feels wrong to try and hold that fi- the twenty year old accountable for what the fifteen year old I mean, did. That may be the truth and the case, but the public is fickle. Yep, they they don't really want to sit down and think about it. They just want to be like, "Ooh, bad kill." Yep. Hey, my rule's a good time, right? Can't control what people feel. Speaking of controversy, because of the whole Russian trademark issue. Have you been trying to avoid like our SCP stuff as a way to like not support it and protest it? Or are you kind of more neutral about the whole situation? Um, I would say I lean. Well, I think what the guy did that they were all angry with, I think what he did is bad. But to sort of like nix all of the art that these people have created that weren't bad, that seems to be sort of unnecessary. Yeah, because if I'm not wrong, he didn't create any of the art in the art book, right? He's just compiled it. Like I don't, I don't even know if he commissioned it or if it was just, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. No, the like situation. I said, I think he just put it together. Like right. I'm not even that's what I it, thought. I compiled it. So I've I, actually in my most recent video, I did use uh, a picture that was apparently used for the art SCP. Um, so no, I'm not making an effort to avoid it because there's a lot of awesome artwork that these people made related to the SCP community. So to just say, hey, because you worked with this this bastard guy, we're black we're blacklisting all of your art. Right. Uh, that doesn't seem right. There is a point where like if if you talk to them and they're aware of the situation and they don't care, then you could make a case for not wanting to uh, promote anything that they do, but just to say, hey, like at random, uh, you don't even know what's going on, but you're associated with somebody I don't like. Fuck you. That's right. un- that's unacceptable behavior. I will say one thing that I'm really happy about is that for a community that's growing so fast, there's very little to no drama other than this recent event. Well, and, you know, last year's whole debacle. That was... Other than that, you know, I think things have been pretty smooth. Every event that we've ever had has always been bigger in the moment than it actually was. Yeah. Yeah, it I, I it's hard to say. I don't really have a perspective on any similarly sized communities. Well, I know with Star Wars there's a lot of like stuff going well, on there. <laughs> I think Star Wars is bigger than SCP. <laughs> <laughs> Off the top of my head. So I, that's what I'm saying. Like I don't know any community that's the same size. Yeah, similar SCP. sizes, yeah. Well, like Undertale. You get Undertale, Homestuck, they're on the same size and you have these like nightmare communities. Mm. That's Supposedly have a lot of issues. Related to what? Oh, like sexual stuff. They try to like sexualize and smut everything. Mm. It's weird. Uh, obviously, you haven't seen some of the... Obviously, yeah, you haven't I've seen, seen some, some of the stuff. fan art. I mean, I've got, a, I've got a fan of mine who does a lot of really good artwork for me. Uh, but she constantly makes the mistake of spreading around her uh, smut fan fiction about Dr. Sumerian. And like, of course, and, and sometimes images... And of course, people who know me, because I'm still active in the community, like the main community, are like, hey, have you seen this? So it's like... I'm glad oh, I don't man, have there's... that issue. Yeah, I, I hope you don't have that issue. Um, I think it's more like personality-based channels yeah. that get that kind of shit. Yeah, I mean, I guess maybe part of it is SCP in general is very unemotional by design. It's very just scientific, horror... Uh, not not always horror horror or comedy whereas something like undertale or science fiction or yeah. fantasy right i think like undertale i've actually never played it but i there's a lot more emotions thrown around yeah for some reason it has a really really young like it got popular with the tumblr crowd mhm and i think you know tumblr seems to breed that's drama that's probably true yeah and i i feel like i guess youtube is the main hub for scp stuff or i guess reddit maybe yeah, I mean, 
certainly many, many people have discovered SCP through YouTube, especially in the recent years. Well, I feel like almost all the creators, like, I've heard of no real drama between us or any real beef or problems overall, at least on the YouTube side of things. We're very lucky in that we're such a, it's a small insular community because, like, how many SCP YouTubers are there really active? Maybe a dozen at most? And half of those do completely different content from everybody else. So maybe there's like six people who are well known for readings and that's about it. And everybody else does something. We're not competing, really. I definitely think that helps a lot. Yeah. I mean, there's there's that one channel that's, that's causing trouble. But other than that. Oh, yeah. Russian guy. No, the, the, the YouTube channel. But that's a pretty small problem. Oh, I didn't want to name. Oh, any right. But you probably don't you probably yeah you beep it out but we'll, we'll keep this conversation going because yeah i wanted to talk about that like the idea of people just literally live because i talked to this earlier with the vietnamese uh youtubers like people literally just lifting videos and being like that's mine now yeah which is under the creative as long as they technically as long as they you know credit people properly they can but they're not even doing that i mean we literally have a whole channel I think it's a Vietnamese channel that like rips off all our stuff and uploads it. Wow. I think one's been dubbing ours actually very badly. So I had I enjoy that. Uh, someone messaged me on Twitter asking if I could put subtitles in my videos and upload to some Chinese forum. And they were like, I got that too. They were like, uh, I, I, I know I don't have to ask your permission, <laughs> but I'm going to anyways. Like, oh, well, thank you. I, I don't. I mean, a lot of my videos, see, that's that's sort of why I was asking about Creative Commons and if my videos fall under that or if they fall under free use. Mm. Just a it's note sort of that, that one discussion. conversation you had, if that person's first language wasn't English, they may not have meant to be rude. That may have just been a bit of a translation error. No, I mean, go, I was I don't not have offended. To... Oh, okay, fair enough. Well, actually, I, I have a friend who speaks Chinese, and for a while... We were thinking that we should go on like Yuku or Weibo because China doesn't really have like a YouTube one site where all their video stuff is. But uh, I've kind of given up on that because I kind of don't want to be put on a list if my content isn't communist friendly. Mm -hmm. By communist, I just mean, you know, CCP, the Chinese government. Um, but, you know, if people want to throw shit up there. Whatever. I try to ensure all my content is communist friendly. Well, t I mean, like we joke about it, but. China is literally the largest emerging market in the world, and that includes for online content, so. Except for YouTube. And uh, I think my content wouldn't be that popular in China because I feel like for sci-fi and fantasy stuff, they prefer more big, flashy, crazy VFX stuff. And that's like the exact opposite of the stuff we make. Also, so. don't they have their own sort of, like, I I'm pretty sure there's a, like, they have their own version of YouTube, if I'm unless i'm remembering correctly. yeah well they don't have like one big site it's like yuku and weibo are the biggest but they have a bunch of different like chinese owned sites that kind of compete against each other for example weibo is a video service mm -hmm. but it's like twitter and uh yuku is more like normal youtube but the problem is a lot of these sites aren't nearly as well run as youtube is and, you know we shit on youtube a lot but we have to thank them for at least how well organized it is at least for most of the time, it's obviously not always perfect, but like these Chinese sites are a mess. Yeah, I mean, I have my problems with YouTube, uh, especially after I was demonetized for a day. But YouTube allows me to do something that I love uh, for a living and earn, you know, earn money. So there's really nothing like it. In a perfect world, there would be all this competition, but it is what it is. I mean, are you pretty concerned mm -hmm. about YouTube just crapping out and, you know, there goes your whole income and livelihood? Yeah, that that's a bigger concern than, than someone slitting my throat. Uh, that's you, the existential dread right yeah, there. Yeah, YouTube slitting my financial throat. Um, it's, it's sort of weird. It's like, I don't have a college degree. And I'm not, with YouTube, like, I'm not building any, like, I'm not working at a corporation. I'm not rising in ranks or anything like that. I'm not building a resume, really, uh, not in the traditional sense. And so it's like if YouTube just implodes, I'm left with basically nothing. Like maybe I have some internet reputation. Maybe I could pivot. But other than that, 
it's nothing. I mean, hey, worst case scenario, a really big upcoming field is social media marketing. So, you know, if you have a big YouTube channel, ooh, that's your resume. Yeah, yeah I guess. It is. If you can go like, hey, I, I built, yeah, you know, I built a community this large. Look at look at me. And hopefully it never comes to that. I mean, that, that doesn't sound as fun as talking about the hanged king for a living or something like that. Not at all. Um, so, yeah, it's sort of just like a big gamble. And I'm kind of just enjoying the ride while I can. I mean, ideally, YouTube would last long enough that I can sort of build up wealth and then I can just go into investments or something like that. But we'll see. Well, you're, you're not just going to buy a bunch of jet skis? No, and a Lamborghini? No, I, I'm not going to do All that. All right, fair enough. Yeah. Well, for me and Jake, we pretty much never expect our YouTube channel to be our full-time job, realistically. Because, mm -hmm. well, YouTube is basically our way to fund our personal creative projects. So we can, like, build our directing reel, build our producing reel, and just get to make cool shit that fans hopefully finance. Ideally, we can eventually move on to making like full feature films and real TV series and then just have the YouTube yeah. series always there in the back. We never want to drop it, but we highly doubt it could ever support me and Jake full time. <laughs> you know, making professional videos is expensive and we're not really happy with the quality right now. And it's like, OK, but if we want to make it professional, it's a lot more expensive. And, and a YouTube channel should really never be started with the intent of it being your job. Yeah, that's usually a bad idea. Yeah, I did. I, I did that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I, I did that. Yeah. I mean, as long as you enjoy it, it's not it's not the worst thing. But like I did, I started doing Let's Plays. And originally when I started doing Let's Plays, I was like, I'm going to be a big YouTube star. And everybody's going to watch my Let's Plays. Um, and then like, you know, six years went by and I was still getting 10 views a video. And I was like, you know what, whatever. It doesn't, I, I decided that it just, it didn't matter because I enjoyed doing it so much. It didn't matter whether I got 10 views or 100,000 views. And so that was basically my philosophy and I was just going to keep doing YouTube for whatever. But then the exploring series started and I was like, wait a minute, there is money to be made. <laughs> um, and so now I feel personally like I have the best of both worlds. I get to put out Let's Play videos on my other channel for 10 views. Uh, and I just love doing it. And then I get to do the SCP stuff and Warhammer stuff and things like that. And I also enjoy doing it, but I also get money. Not to brag and make you feel bad, but I think I think the source of that critique of the or at least that that advice don't start a YouTube video with the intention of just trying to make money is because a lot of people will sacrifice quality or their or their fun level like you're talking about mm -hmm. to make as much money as possible or they're just impatient they're like I'm, I'm doing this to make money and you know it could take a year or two years for you to finally catch on and then during that entire time you're doing a lot of work for nothing and yep. most people can't handle that psychologically so it's good advice for most people but that's exactly what I did and I, I when I started I was like I'm gonna make money at this but I know it's gonna take a couple years I mean, at least for me, part of the reason why I'm watching are YouTubers, part of the reason why I like them is because they feel genuine. They feel like there's a real love for the material they're making. I feel like it's really hard to fake that you love your content if you're just trying to make a quick buck. Right. I think audiences usually can read that. It's true, but I think there's a common... I think I was talking about this in uh, another server, where I think uh, with a couple other people, but there's a middle ground. You can do both. They're not mutually exclusive. They can be for some people, but I think you can do yeah. both. And I would say that's that's the exploring series. It's most of the time, I do enjoy what I'm doing. It is a, pretty much a dream job. But there are videos that I've worked on where it's like, I don't want to do this at all. The only reason I'm doing this is because it's going to make some money. Um, but it's nice knowing that past that video, I'm going to go back to something. I'm going to I'm going to be covering stuff that I do enjoy. And so I have the the yin and yang. What's that old industry term? One for them and one for you? Yeah, right. Yeah, like that. I mean, for me too. I mean, the main reason why Jake and I started up a YouTube channel was because we really wanted to have an audience that like gives a shit about the stuff we make and ideally holds us to a certain standard. 
because you know i feel like especially in the film industry you get a lot of people where if they've been in the industry for a while they get a huge ego they think they're hot shit and everything they make afterwards is like total crap right i feel like you know if you've had a community that's been with you since you were nothing they're gonna hold you to a certain bar and expect the best from you on the flip side of that though that's actually been one of my own sort of neurological concerns is that sometimes I'll finish a, actually almost every time I finish a video I hate it and I'm like this I should not release this this is terrible <laughs> um but then most of the time these videos are ended up you know well received and it's like am I actually still putting out decent videos or do I just have this fan base and they'll just like anything that I put out oh imposter syndrome I have that yes. concern yeah I definitely get that feeling what I've kind of realized, and you know, it helps to have a partner, is when I'm working on a video for so long, any sort of appeal or interest <laughs> is just sucked out of it. But when I have that second or, or third perspective, it's not just me and Jake. We have a bunch of people who we check our stuff out. They'll give me that fresh critique, and you know, I trust them as a creator, so I'm gonna listen to them. Like, Doorman's a really good example. Like a lot of people really liked that video, but when I was about to release it, I was like, this is the most mundane, <laughs> boring shit I've made. Cause you know, when you're editing it so often, there's no element of surprise, there's no tension. Cause I'm adding all the music, I'm mixing all the sounds together. But supposedly people really liked it one, so it's cool. Yeah, it's like one out of 10 videos that I'm actually like, hey, I put out something decent. <laughs> All the rest is just like this. I how can I release? The only reason I'm releasing this is because it's my job. That's it. And huh. it it ends up being that apparently my own neuroses, because you know no one has remarked like, "Wow, your videos are dipping in quality, man." Um, things keep clipping along just fine. It's just my own neuroses. I which feel I, like maybe I think that I happens like to a lot crazy of crazy one here. I feel like I'm the crazy one here because I constantly look at my stuff and go, yep, that's the best thing I've ever made. <laughs> well, look at you. Like one after another. I'm like, yep, <laughs> that's the best thing I've ever made. And then the next time. I mean, I have made videos and I'm like, this is this is awesome that I'm actually really proud with it. And then it does like it's one of my weakest performing videos. And I'm like, oh, well, that's nice. So and at this point, I have no idea what people want to see and what's good or not. I mean, that's why me and Jake, I think, are always constantly trying to change it up. They can't shit it on us too hard because, you know, they don't know what to expect. And, hey, at least they tried something new. We're here to subvert expectations. We expected it to be good. Shit. Yeah. And my other biggest problem is um, facts. That's my other biggest problem or concern is, like, how much of this did I get wrong? I mean, uh, yeah, I, yeah. am I just going to get torn apart in the comment section? Like, how could you say this? Especially when I start a series. Um, like, I started recently Warhammer 40k, and I, like I said, I knew nothing about it going in. And it's like, I'm entering into this just gigantic lore universe that people have been studying and learning about for decades. And I'm trying to make these lore videos. Do I even know what the hell I'm talking about? So you said you never leave the house. <laughs> So, Occasional. So, do you feel like going to conventions like Warhammer, Star Wars, SCP? Although I don't think they have SCP conventions. Uh, Not they yet. are. Oh, okay. Well, like compared to Warhammer, you have BlizzCon or something. Yeah. yeah. Wait, wait, wait. No, BlizzCon is uh, World of Warcraft. Yeah. That was pretty sad. <laughs> do you feel like World of Warhammer? Gotcha. Do you feel like, you know, meeting real hardcore fans in person will make you feel like a part of the community and get rid of like the whole imposter syndrome effect? Uh, I mean, so far that, I mean, I haven't had any experiences with that and I don't really go to that many conventions. Um, I think it would be an interesting experience. I, in general, I'm pretty introverted, so it's not super appealing to me to run around all these different conventions and and meet all these fans and stuff like that not to disparage anyone but it's just a, a personal thing i mean overall it doesn't seem like i mean you you have a the biggest problems with a lot of fans uh is just being nitpicky nit nitpickers are just 
you know, Warhammer sort of has that problem. I was going to say, do you run into that problem a lot with your channel that's devoted to talking about lore? <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, like Warhammer, when I first started that and I was looking at, I was, I don't watch other videos because I don't want to like influence my own, but I was looking around in YouTube searches and things like that to see how, what the YouTube video or the Warhammer video community is like. And there's a lot of like super lengthy, deep, deep dives into Warhammer 40k lore. These videos are like an hour long and stuff like that. And it's just like there isn't really a great, there aren't that many great YouTube series that are just for introduction. That are just like educational, basic videos to introduce somebody to a topic. And that's always been my goal with the Exploring series is education first, entertainment second. I've always wanted to just introduce people to a new topic so that they could learn more on their own. Uh, and that's always how I've approached making my videos is for newcomers. But the problem is the only people that mostly watch videos are the super diehard fans that watch everything. And they're like, why did you say this sentence instead of this? And how could you forget to mention this? What the hell is going on? Um, so they don't appreciate that this is not a super deep dive in 15 minutes. It's, it's just for newcomers. If it makes you feel better, I was randomly checking out Warhammer because of Jake. Mm -hmm. And I did unintentionally stumble upon one of your Warcraft uh, videos and watched it. So nice. us newcomers nice. do watch your stuff. Yeah, I mean, it happens. It's just the vocal minority is is the, the hardcore fans of, of every topic I've covered. Yeah, what's that, what's that old joke about the politician who says, how come only sons of bitches know how to write letters? Um, yeah, so that's sort of been my pet peeve as a YouTuber covering lore is that these people come in and just nitpick everything. And I understand, I understand why they would be upset about, because they, they are big fans. They love this topic. They love talking about it. They love it, seeing it being discussed. Um, it's just annoying to me personally, because I make every video for the newcomer. Mm. Well, it's one of those things. What if you do something like Beginner's Guide? I see people doing shit like that. It's kind of like when you... With these people... Like, Star Wars is a good example of it, and I'm sure it happens with Warhammer or even Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. People who are super fans of something. SCP, too, probably. They tie up a lot of their personal self-worth in it. So the idea of right. you doing... You know, they think that you're mangling it because you're not going into the depth of detail that they want you to. It's like you're attacking their self-worth and they can't let that go. I think part of the problem is that I can't relate to these people. <laughs> um, I, to put it bluntly, I myself would never watch an exploring series video because um, I just tend to read everything. So I don't really watch that many YouTube videos in general on, on topics because I just like reading about stuff. Um, and so... I, I can't relate to this super fan that already knows all the stuff that I'm talking about would come to an educational video about a topic just to nitpick stuff. This is related to the meme thing, though. This is the idea of like a shared experience. So right. they're super fans, so they're just out there. They, they're they so into it. They're so invested that they're looking for anything they can find that's related yeah. to the thing that they're invested in. I understand it. I just can't relate to it. I do still have a hard time with like relating to super fans because I like to bounce around a lot with stuff. Yes. I'd say the closest thing I am to like a super fan is, um, do you guys know Wildbow? But you know, I feel like that's cause it's a small community. And when there's a small community, it pushes you to kind of want to get into it more to, you know, support the creator and the whole team because you don't see a lot of support for it. But in the end, I feel like it just boils down to your personality. Like some people just love to like obsess over one thing, like especially with Star Wars and Marvel. Right. And th that's that's sort of my thing is I've never been <laughs> that passionate about any topic. You know, I, I mean, I made my first Cthulhu Mythos videos just because I was interested in the Cthulhu Mythos video. But even that 15 minute video that I found that sparked the whole thing, I didn't even watch that video. You know what's funny though, your origin for your channel that you saw that and was like, the, the, you were so into the Cthulhu mythos that you were like, the 15 minute video, there's no way that covers everything. I'm going to yeah. do a better job. Is literally the same thing, it's just further down the line. Yeah. So 
time. I, I was a super, super fan. I was I was so much of a fan I wouldn't even watch the video because I thought I could do better. Yeah, I always find that interesting when you hear about like creators who never watch their own stuff and their own medium. Like every now and then you hear about film directors who don't watch any yeah. sort of movies. Yeah, I have no <sighs> idea how that works. And I also don't have any idea how you manage it either, but especially for I like, think it's like, a way to keep things fresh. I, I guess. I mean, I feel like with film, there's definitely an echo chamber effect and you start kind of re copying and repeating Maybe it depends everything. on the person. You get stuck in styles. Yeah, maybe it depends just, on the person because people know themselves and know that they would do that so they avoid it. But I, I personally, I wouldn't, I don't see how that would work for me. It's kind of like, um, kind of like joke stealing, I feel, where even if you don't intend to like steal somebody's joke, you just hear it and then it just later just becomes incorporated into your material. That's sort of my concern with like watching SCP videos, although there aren't that many that are like mine or Warhammer videos. Yeah, I'll I just... recall someone someone asked you one time in the uh, Discord uh, whether or not you'd watched any of my, my last video on a similar topic to something you were covering. And you were like, no, I don't watch anything else. And I was like, it's an interesting way to go about it. <laughs> I just, I, I don't want anyone else's content to influence mine, which I understand that could be a good thing for someone else to influence what I do, but I just try to avoid it entirely. I'm just like, I do my own research. I don't ask that many questions. Uh, I just read stuff and then I just put out a video and it seems to have worked so far. I guess your mentality is yeah. if it's not broken, don't fix it. Yeah, yeah that's basically. exactly what it is. Yeah. If your if your methods work for you creativity and creative works or it's art there's no one way to do it yeah i mean i don't know if either of you are familiar with uh body vidya yeah no i love that guy yeah so he I'm had not, a but... he, he's a he's a dark souls big dark souls fan. souls born lord channel um but he had a controversy a while back about him stealing video content from another creator and because there were just all these similarities in like what he was talking about and what he was showing on screen between this other guy's video. And it's like, I don't know if it ever became clear if he admitted to it or if it was just like some unconscious thing that he was watching this person's video and he just borrowed a lot of concepts and then he had to go through that controversy. And it's just like, I, I don't want to, I want to avoid any of that. I mean, there's the argument that, you know, nothing's original. So even if you're really trying to avoid it, you might accidentally still end up copying a bunch of shit. True. It's just a matter of, you know, how much are you actually copying and ripping off shit? Well, it's it's funny, because I'm like the exact opposite of you. I'm always trying to gobble up and try new short films, mm -hmm. feature films, TV series. To like mix and match different styles. Yesterday I was at a film festival for my university. I graduated already, but a film I produced was in it. But, you know, a lot of student films are flawed, but I always feel like there's cool things that you can always take away um, and keep in mind for when I approach a new video or a new film. You know, for example, like there's so many layers to film and I'm not a cinematographer, but I still have to, f I'm forced to shoot most of my own videos. So that's why I'm compelled to watch more videos and kind of build my dialogue of like camera work and framing and make things more interesting. Yeah. I know personally for me, you know, it might be different for you, but I can very easily get stuck in circles mm -hmm. and bubbles. So if I'm not constantly reaching out, uh, my growth is definitely hindered. Well, and that's part of my benefit is I don't really have to like experiment or, or innovate with what I do. It's just a, l a lore summary. So my, my content is not as uh, perhaps innovative as what you do. So are you ever worried like, you know, YouTubers will talk about burnout and channels falling flat. So are you ever worried about like, how can I evolve or am I just gonna dive into another lore and just drop whatever has gone flat instead of changing the formula? I mean, that certainly is a benefit for my channel is that I can just be like, well, then we're just gonna move on to talking about Greek mythology. Um, and so that's sort of the evolution of my channel. If I had just stuck with Cthulhu Mythos and was like, this is a Cthulhu Mythos channel, that's all we're doing. I think at this point, I would be nowhere near where I am today. So I count the lore switching as part of the evolution. 
Well, that's interesting because I know with some channels that they completely revamp their style. But with you, you have this nice middle ground. Yeah, I, I, I just I'm not that creative of a person. I, I just can't. Th I mean, like my brother, who is not in the YouTube world, although he tried to get into it, and he's always like, so when are you going to like switch stuff up? When are you going to try like some green screen stuff and, and try and do some new things? And I'm like, why, why would I try that? I, I don't That's know anything about idea, that. That's a bad idea, by the way. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, I just I never felt the need to innovate beyond just switching a topic and moving on. Overall, I feel like I've just sort of stumbled through this YouTube thing and it's worked out. That, that's my overall philosophy. That's how it works for everybody, isn't it, though? Like, the people who are successful generally just happen to hit the right buttons in the right direction. You know, yeah. They got the yeah. Konami code correct on the first try, but that was only because there was a billion people trying. Well, I have a question for you guys. I always like playing with different alternate timelines, especially with my own life. So if YouTube never happens, where do you think you guys would be in your own life right now? Um, okay, I'll go first. I would probably be working uh, for my parents. They own a small art company that employs pretty much all my other family members. Uh, it's very sort of menial work that I did not enjoy when I used to work there. Um, cause like I said, I dropped out. I, I, I did not get a college degree. I dropped out after my first year cause I just, I couldn't stand someone else telling me information instead of me just learning it myself. And so just sitting through all those classes did not sit well with me. So in an alternate timeline, uh, perhaps if I had stuck through school and made some better choices, uh, I could see myself as a lawyer. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, what about you, Sim? I honestly think I'd still just be a writer. You know? I mean, I'm a writer for the SCP Wiki. I'm not, maybe I would have more than 100 articles up by now. I just would can probably still be working in fast food and writing until something took off in that direction instead. Or it could be like a forest fire watcher where you just live in a glass cabin in the middle of the nowhere on a mountain and, you know, get plenty of writing done there. Yeah. No, I'm all right. Uh, have you ever tried to actually write, like, a, a novel? I've not really sat down and written to that level before. Like, I, I'm i very familiar with the flash fiction, and I've done a few short stories here and there, on, even on the wiki. But a novel is a bit of a commitment, and I've got mm -hmm. ideas, sure. But sure. Like, I, but it's one of those things, like, I, I've, heck, I've made video games before, too. I mean, I've made a video game for the SCP wiki. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of, like... All these creative outlets are possibilities, but the one that I've settled on for the moment is YouTube. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I brought this up earlier, but the whole not wanting to be put into a pigeonhole, especially in my field where people get this idea in their head that if you're a director, you direct and you do nothing else. And for me, I, I hate that completely because I don't want to be just known as a filmmaker, but eventually, you know, me and Jake have video game ideas that we want to get into. I mean, I write, I direct, I shoot, I produce, I try to have my hands kind of in every piece of the puzzle. So that way, ideally, I can never just be viewed as always oh, just that one thing. That's it. Yeah, I mean, that. that's why I keep switching lores, so I can just keep doing different things. I think when it comes to creating, especially like even for, you know, you do film, it's a matter of everything you do is similar so you can create a script you can write a story you can create a game it's all narrative is always important so if you can do that you can do anything that was that was my problem actually um when i was in college i actually wrote a screenplay and tried to shop it around for like a week before realizing it was terrible um and that was always the thing during like high school and stuff like that is I fancied myself as a writer. I was like, I, cause I was, I was good with, with English, with the words and things. And yeah, so I was like, the word things. right. And I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to be a writer. But I realized that I was always too concise. That was always the criticism that I got from every teacher was like, you know, this is good writing, but it's, it's too short. It's too concise. You need to keep going. Uh, cause I would always just like crunch everything down into a minimalist form 
And so it's funny your, now. Your that, teachers, your teachers sound terrible. Like they're giving you terrible advice. By the way. <laughs> yeah, maybe. But it's funny now that I ended up doing summaries <laughs> as, as my writing, so that I don't have to like flesh things out, and I'm encouraged to crunch things down. People have a very strong tendency to like make things far longer than they need to be, and that's a common piece of advice I hear from people who have no idea what the fuck they're talking about. Two writers is this needs to be longer. I'm like, no, it doesn't. Stop advising people. I, yeah. I, I hate that advice. It, it it irks me something fierce. Oh man, time for that book club sequence thing. We'll, we'll get a name. Oh, okay. I yeah. mean, there we go. Yeah. You know, keep it simple. The super cool book club. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this is uh this is SCP thirty four fifty four, and it's it's a cognito hazard, right? I mean, that's what I assume. I mean, yeah, that seems to be the the inclination that it's giving. Although it could just be not even a cognito hazard. There are many ways this could become this could come out, but cognito hazard is the easiest way to define it. It's interesting to me that the SCP is not the the alternate dimension where tall bees exist, but the SCP itself is people that don't believe that the bees are tall. Yeah, it's one of those things where the SCP has so already. In basically infiltrated the foundation and made them believe a thing and now anyone who doesn't believe that thing are the ones that are wrong like the uh the samothrace thing yeah a little bit like samothrace except there's just this one dude doctor which it doesn't this is this is one of my uh, i actually have an issue with it it doesn't really go into why there are people that don't believe in the tall bees mm -hmm. or why it seems to be that that's a minority of people because obviously most of the people at the site you look at the last test there, there's like a two dozen people, maybe? I can't, I'm not going to count it, but like two dozen people trying to convince this one guy that the bees are tall. And now that guy used to believe that the bees were tall. Well, no, no, he's dead now. Because they they took two dozen people in a claw hammer and tried to convince him that it, they were tall. <laughs> <laughs> and the test results are that he's unresponsive after 20 minutes. But that guy is formerly dr page who was the mm -hmm. lead researcher yeah but he if you know if you would take a look at his note he's n the important part about his note is that he has recognized that there is a problem which means he's likely not affected he's just looking at other people talking about how tall the bees are and going what the fuck is wrong with you people hmm see the bit where he says the test was not authorized i suspect it's having an adverse effect on my team i'm calling a moratorium on testing until we can get an info hazard response team down here means it it Indicates he's not affected by the info hazard. Otherwise, he wouldn't have recognized it as a problem. Mm, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's that's the implication. And then in the final test, they realize that he is affected. Yeah, they call him SCP-345-145, which means, I suppose, there's at least 144 other individuals who didn't believe that bees were tall, but... Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then they... Isn't it endless, though? What's that? I mean, most of the population probably doesn't think that bees are tall. I mean, that's the problem with this. There's a certain level of... It plays on uncertainty. That's sort of how this works. You don't know exactly what's going on. But there's so much uncertainty, I think, that it, it's hard to understand exactly what's happening with the story. I mean, it even talks about how there's inconsistencies in the in the story and that's just inherent there's nothing you can do about it but like, what the hell is happening here i yeah. don't know something it, about tall bees it's perhaps almost too minimalist yeah it's not bad by the way this is a very I, I think this is a good article i just i i it's not perfect obviously no no article is perfect i think this has mm -hmm. more flaws than than a lot of other things that are lower rated what, what, to to note to the audience by the way when we decided on this at the in the last podcast the end of the last podcast this was rated at plus 81, I want to say, or maybe 84. I don't remember exactly. I quoted it then, uh, but it was actually featured on the front page for a short period of time. So it actually is all, all the way up to 154 at the time of our reading now, and it may go even higher uh, by the time this is released. So just as a, a bit of a note for the dissonance between the two uh, podcasts. For me, what I want more out of this is like, you know, what are the consequences? Is there a motive or a reason why they want them to believe bees are tall? Is it like, um, I can't think of it. You know, there's like these creatures that need to like, in order to live, they need to feed off of your belief of them. 
Like their power is completely dependent right. on how many people believe in them and follow Bad them. screamers. They have this oh, wait, no, these part are of the special right, containment procedures are to <laughs> figure out a way to introduce the entire population of Earth to the land of tall bees one person at a time. I'm sorry, I was looking at the date month format and I was like, why are these individual why are these tests one month after each uh, one month <laughs> after each other? And then I was like, oh wait, no, it's backwards from yeah. what I'm considering. Those are one day after the other. I still <clears throat> Yeah, like there's just too much unknown here and it's too minimalist. You're absolutely correct on that. Yeah, I mean there's definitely some cognito hazardous mimetic something going on. But <clears throat> The fact that there's not even like any sort of info on the land as far as like an exploration log, it, it just doesn't. Yeah, it's a little small. I mean, I would say I don't think adding to it fixes that problem. I think you can keep it at the same length and probably just explain a few more details about what's going on in the in the extant uh, bit uh, in the extant description, and you would probably be fine. But it does say research is ongoing, so it's like. That's the cop out at the end of the special containment yeah. procedures. It says research is ongoing. Although I will note, oddly, and then it just hit me, that shouldn't be in the special containment procedures because that's not part of the containment procedures. Mm -hmm. Research is ongoing. We don't need to know that. But that's a cop and really, out. See. Yeah, I mean, the special containment procedures honestly should be talking about like how you keep civilians away from this target. Yeah, or in this case, because of the way the cognito hazard works, it the rest of it works because it's like. They're literally introducing people to the concept because they want them to be infected by the cognito hazard. That's the premise of the of the piece. But saying research is ongoing at the bottom of it is like the writer literally acknowledging there's not enough here. But, you know, mm -hmm. that's just how it is. Like, well, why is former in blue? <laughs> just as an example, why is former in blue? Yeah, I don't know. That's usually with like with a different revision of an article like if an scp is, goes through multiple revisions they'll post changes in blue but we don't have any former context here yeah we don't have any context to make that decision unfortunately i like it i would suggest it to people to read but if they came away going if if somebody if i suggested it to somebody in chat i would expect their response to be wtf afterwards mm -hmm. yeah I, I think it's a fun concept i like how you know, we usually assume the SCP Foundation is the one that's in on it and is woke, but in this case, the SCP has control over them. Yeah, and, that's and there are a lot the of case. fun ideas. That, I was going to say, and there, there, there's more than one article that does this exact thing, and I think that's part of my issue with it is that there are other articles that do it better. Uh, and part of that has always been like, like when we talk about um, uh, Yellowstone or the uh, uh, Sam, a Samoth race is another one. Mm -hmm. Like the articles that this has already been done is the problem. Like, if it yeah. was novel and original, I'd be like, oh, this is a neat idea. But to me, it's like, this is a neat idea that I've seen done better two or three times. Now, is this still an above average version of that idea? Sure. But if I've seen excellent and great already, eh. And the tone of the writing is a little odd. And I'm not sure if it's, like, done on purpose or not. It does say, it does say some tonal inconsistencies persist. So apparently it's I don't know and we don't know why it would cause people to have tonal inconsistencies when writing about it. Where does it say this? Uh, at the beginning of the testing logs. Oh, well, I meant like in the description where it says you do not want tall, upset bees. No, yeah, yeah, I agree with what you're saying there. I'm just saying like that's that, all, that never... note in the that note at the beginning of the testing logs is kind of indicate it's an indication for the entire article, even though it oh, is okay. specifically for that. But, but right. I'm so saying it's from like, a writer's standpoint. If that's done on purpose. There's no explanation whatsoever for why that would exist. Yeah. Why Why does it change people's tone? What, what, well, why would it do that? And there are, I mean, there are a lot of SCPs where they don't explain everything and it's good. Like, I, I actually like a lot of SCPs where it's left unexplained or left to your imagination. Um, but I also feel at the end of the day, you do have to provide something to jump off of and i don't know if there's enough here yeah this is a nice bite-sized piece i, I wouldn't i i I'd said earlier if i suggested it to somebody to read they would react with what the fuck but i wouldn't suggest this to somebody to read personally i'm reading mm -hmm. it i kind of enjoy it i can see why other people would enjoy it i mean i think plus 154 is a bit a bit high but that's just my opinion 
Uh, mm -hmm. But I wouldn't suggest this to somebody who's even if they were familiar with the SCP Foundation, be like, hey, you want to read this thing? Because uh, what is it? I don't know. Yeah, I think the only way you would ever make in a video that I made would be if I did a B SCP video. Oh, yeah, bees. What if bees were bees? What if bees were bees? What if bees were bees? We talk about memes. That's one of the best ones. I th I actually kind of like it when when uh, SCPs end up memed and the bees uh, thing is a very fun one. What if what if we were bees? What if bees were bees? Oh. Yeah. What if yeah. the SCP podcast were bees? Yeah. Well, uh, actually, before we go, Ming, do you have anything you want to shout out or uh, let our viewers know about? <sighs> um, not specifically. Uh, I mean, I would just encourage anyone looking for some more in-depth summaries and dives into the SCP universe to check out my channel. Um, and also, if you're interested in any of Cthulhu Mythos, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, Elder Scrolls, Norse Mythology, Warhammer 40k, I've covered it all on my channel. We're going to link to your channel in the description of the podcast, but uh, will you go ahead and name check it right now so people can... The Exploring Series. Well, thank you guys for tuning in to the Special Containment Podcast. Next time, we'll have a special new guest, so stay tuned. Peace. Peace. Peace.